get into our study. Today we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 12 here in chapter 1. I'll begin reading at verse 7. I'll read to verse 12 and give you some introductory comments and all and then move into our study. We're looking today in the fact that in Him we have redemption. That's going to be the subject that we're taking up today as we look at these verses. So beginning at verse 7, reading to verse 12, Paul writes, In Him... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. You know, as I look at this, let me introduce it by saying, this is deep. These things that he's saying, extremely deep, and it it, uh, it, it, um impresses me that the, um, that the church, the church there in, in Ephesus, understood what he's saying. And it takes, it takes me a lot of study just to get a glimpse of the things that they would have understood as this letter, because this is a letter. He's, it's like Paul, an apostle, writing to the saints in Ephesus, you know, blessings to you and all of that. It's a letter. And so as I was reading this today, I thought, this is so filled with wisdom and, and depth, and I'm so incapable of giving it a, a, a study that is given a study that brings justice to this, but I'll do my best to help us to understand some of the things that he has to say here. So let's begin by remembering a few things. Paul is instructing the church in Ephesus concerning what it means to be a Christian. As I shared with you last time, the church began through the apostle Paul and was uh, cared for after Paul had left by a couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. Remember with me that Paul had come to the city of Ephesus on a mission trip, and he had left Aquila and Priscilla there, and Aquila began ministering to those who had come to faith in Christ, and the church gathered and began to meet. Now, later on, Paul returned. It's found in Acts 19. It it records how Paul had later returned to Ephesus. It may have been one or two years later, and when he had arrived, he found some disciples, some disciples of John the Baptist, and they had... uh, they, had, they were living there in the city of Ephesus, and, and he asked them if they had received the Holy Spirit. He said, have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? And so when he said that, they said they hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit. So what baptism were you baptized with, Paul asked them. They said, well, with John's baptism. And so that helped to clarify some things for Paul as he's speaking to these Ephesians in And he said, oh, he said, okay, John baptized a baptism of repentance for the one who was about to come, speaking of Jesus. And he began to share with them more fully what the gospel actually meant and all. And so he began to share the gospel. And as he did so, they came to faith in Christ and they were saved. And then later they received water baptism and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 19, verse 6, it says, when Paul had laid hands on them, The Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And so this gives us insight into why Paul would write this letter to the Ephesian church. It was his desire that the people not only come to faith in Christ, but to have everything that Christ has for them. His desire was that they would mature in their faith in Jesus Christ. He desired believers to have everything that the Lord has prepared for them and has given to them. We need to remember something. Becoming a Christian isn't just repeating a prayer and then going on and living the life that you had lived before you prayed that prayer. When someone's saved, they receive an entirely new life. They receive a new way of life. And there's a change that occurs because the Holy Spirit, when you're saved, comes to dwell within you. So when Paul spoke to John's disciples, he immediately discerned there's something missing. And that something was the presence of the Holy Spirit. It was noticeably lacking in them. You see, his desire is for all believers to enter into this new life and not fall short of what God would have for us. You see, Jesus made it clear that he could provide for us that which nobody else could ever provide. 
In John 6, 35, he said, I'm the bread of life, and he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes on me shall never thirst. I can give you what the world can't give you, is what Jesus was saying. Well, Paul desired them to live in the blessings that God had already provided for them, and he wanted them to fully grasp what they had in Jesus Christ. Now, they lived in the midst of a, a beautiful city, an extremely beautiful, yet it was terribly corrupt. Because of his cosmopolitan flavor, opportunity to indulge the flesh was always present. So to combat this draw, they needed to live in what they had in Jesus Christ. And so we saw how Paul began reminding the church of the blessings that they have in Christ. Remember in verse 3 how he said, we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing? Well, from there he began to list spiritual blessings that we possess in Christ. In verse 4, he said, we've been chosen in him before the foundation of the world. In verse 5, he, he said, we have the, been adopted as sons and daughters by Jesus to himself. Verse 6, he said, God, by his grace, has made us acceptable to himself through the beloved. Now, when he said he's made us acceptable to himself, that word acceptable or accepted means to be surrounded by favor. It means to be made agreeable. He has honored us with blessings. By his grace, he has honored us with his blessings through the beloved. The beloved is another way of speaking of Jesus Christ. Remember in Matthew 3, 17, that a voice had come from heaven when Jesus was baptized, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So we became acceptable to God. We became acceptable to God because his grace provides salvation through Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, it says, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because, our faith, because of our faith in Christ, not because we've obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law, the law of Moses. No man will be made right with God by simple obedience or attempting to obey Moses' law. And so he's been sharing concerning these things. We're acceptable to God. And at this point, he continues to write about the blessings that we receive. Notice in verse 7 how he says, In him we have redemption through his blood. Redemption. I'm going to share about that for just a moment because that's the key to this uh, passage. In him, verse 7, we have redemption through his blood. Redemption speaks of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment. Redemption speaks of the clearing of a debt. Now, I'm going to give some ancient history to some of you. In the 60s, I'll let that settle. It's a long time ago. But some of you will know this. We had something called S&H green stamps. Anybody remember those? Anybody? Some of you do. Maybe your grandparents saved them. You also have blue chip stamps. You remember that? s and green stamps, blue chip stamps. What were they? Well, they were a loyalty program. I actually cut this out, and I'm reading exactly what it says. They were a loyalty program for customers. You'd go to a grocery store or a gas station, you'd make a purchase, and you'd be given stamps in proportion to the dollar amount of the purchase. Then you'd take these stamps, and you'd put them in a book, and you'd collect a number of books, and then you would go to what they called the Redemption Center. And there you'd get these amazing dishes or lawn furniture, dining table. I remember my mom getting a waffle maker. I'd never had a waffle in my life, but now we have a waffle maker, right? So, but you got those with S&H green stamps. And so it was a way of obtaining something through taking these things you collected and then redeeming or purchasing it. Well, in the New Testament, redemption is used to speak of how the Lord has purchased us. Redemption is the action of saving or being saved from sin, from error or evil. Now I'm going to develop this for just a moment here so we understand a little bit because he's speaking concerning this and he says again in verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood. Redemption. We have redemption through his blood. In the New Testament, there are two Greek legal words that I use to, to refer to redemption. So by combining these words, we can get a 
a more full insight of what he's speaking about. There's a word agorazo, agorazo. It's also, the, there's a word that's, it's taken from the root agorazo, it's ex agorazo. Uh, those are Greek words that are related. They speak about buying or purchasing. Now, I've been to Greece. I've been there a couple of times. I spent a month in Greece. And we were in Athens. And while we were in the city of Athens back in 1975, we went to the Agora. The Agora is the marketplace. It's like the flea markets that we have out here. So you go to the Agora. You go to the marketplace. Well... Agorazza, or ex agorazzo, uh, speaks of buying something out of a marketplace. So you go to the marketplace and you're purchasing something. In the New Testament, it speaks of a spiritual purchase. It speaks of redemption. It speaks of God redeeming or purchasing us from the marketplace, from the marketplace of sin. Now, there's a second word that is used. It's lutruo. It means to release from captivity by the payment of a ransom. So this is paying a ransom in order to release a person from bondage. It was used especially when someone was purchased out of slavery. Now, ever since the fall, all mankind has been slaves to sin and corruption. Ever since the fall, everyone has been in spiritual bondage to a nature that is in constant act of rebellion against God. So before we were redeemed, we were in bondage to sin. In Romans 6, verse 16, Paul said, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So before redemption, the Bible teaches that we, through human nature, are in bondage to sin because of a sin nature. The Bible teaches that sin holds us captive, and there is a payment that is required for our release. In John 8, 34 through 36, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abides not in the house forever. But the Son abides forever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Whoever commits sin is a servant or a slave to sin. Jesus was saying a person whose life is filled with habitual sin is actually the servant of sin. He is the slave to sin. And so in spiritual redemption, death is the payment that is acceptable to God. In Leviticus 17, 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. And so the price of redemption is the blood of Jesus Christ. God himself paid the price when he sent Jesus to die for us. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, during the uh, New Testament times, Rome had somewhere around 6 million slaves. So if I was free, but my friend was a slave, I could actually redeem my friend out of slavery. I would have to pay the price, and then I would write a certificate and then I, having, having purchased him, could set him free. Well, Jesus is a friend of sinners, and this is what Jesus did for us. Matthew eleven nineteen 19 tells us Jesus had been called a friend of sinners. And so redemption, the redemption price, according to verse 7, is his blood. And we have redemption through his blood and have been set free from bondage to sin. He died on the cross. He paid the price for all who believe, and he has set us free. And the one whom the Son sets free, Jesus said, is completely free, is free indeed. Now, this was accomplished according, notice verse 7, according to the riches. The word um, riches speaks of the abundance, the riches of his grace. So according to 
speaks of the vast revenue and the resources of the grace of God. Now, I want to develop this with you for a moment. He didn't give us redemption simply out of his grace. He gave us redemption according to his grace. If he gave us out of his grace, well, that's not the same as giving to us according to his grace. So how can I illustrate that? Well, Elon Musk, some of you know his name. He makes a cologne for men. No, I'm just kidding. Then. <laughs> Elon Musk. I wanted to use this as an illustration. If Elon Musk gave out of his abundance, a billion-dollar gift would not be that much. And just think about that for a moment, which we really can't understand, because I looked up what his net worth is, and it's gone up since last time I looked at it. His net worth, according to a source I got out of, uh, I got this today, is $277.4 billion. Okay, we don't know what that means. I haven't got a clue what that means. So I wanted to try and understand that. So I said, okay, almighty Google, let me ask you a question. If I were to spend a million dollars a day, a million dollars a day, I don't think there's anybody in this room, beginning with me, who has a vision for a million dollars a day, okay? I don't have that. I, I could spend a few, maybe a week or two. How long would it take for Elon Musk, if he spent a, a million dollars every day, how long would it take him to exhaust his wealth if he wasn't getting any interest on it? It would take around 760 years for him to spend at the rate of a million dollars a day. Let that sink in. 760 years spending a million dollars a day. So if he gave out of, if he gave out of his resources a billion dollars, I wouldn't turn it down. <laughs> But he's giving out of his resources. But what if he gave according to his resources? That's a different thing. Because out of his resources, a billion dollars is nothing. According to his resources, he could give abundantly more than that. And the point that Paul is making is that, that, that God gave to us not simply out of, but according to the riches of his grace. If we could only grab hold of what that means, because I have to be honest with you, all these years I've walked with the Lord, that still amazes me, because his grace is that super abundant. There's not a sin, not a single sin that I've ever committed that his grace is not going to cover. The blood of Christ cleanses me from all sin according to his grace. If the church if we begin to understand how super abundantly blessed we've been in Christ, our lives do change. Our lives do change. And we'll see this a little bit. We're going to be seeing this in the first couple chapters of, of Ephesians. I won't belabor that point other than to say he gave out of his abundance. He gave according to his abundance, rather. And that's, that's how God gave. God gave to us according to the riches of his grace. <laughs> Excuse me. So God's grace is not only given according to his riches, but it has been lavished upon us. And his grace covers the complete extent of our sinfulness. In other words, he doesn't barely cover us with grace. He lavishly gives us super abundance of grace. And his grace is given to us freely. Look at chapter 2, verse 7 for a moment here in Ephesians. It says that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So he has given to us in a lavish manner his grace. In Romans 3.24, we all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And so Paul is making it clear that it's in Christ that we have the forgiveness of our sins. Now notice that in verse 7, when he speaks concerning the forgiveness of sins. 
the forgiveness of sins. People often explain sin away. You know this. I know this. I did it. Perhaps you did it. You know, we explain it away. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I, I did that, but that's really my personality. Yeah, I did that, but you don't understand my addictions. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I might have done that, but <laughs> you don't know my parents. Oh, I, I, yeah, I did that, but I lived in a bad environment. Yeah, I did that, but you see, I, I never received an education. Or, yeah, I, I, I've done that, but you don't understand my culture. Uh, I did that, but you don't understand I was raised in poverty. We make, we make excuses and explanations for the things that the Bible calls sin. We explain it away. Yeah, I have a hot temper, but I'm Latin. All Latins have hot tempers, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that, that's what we say, you know, and all of that. Well, that's simply not true. What that is is the sin nature. And, and the Bible speaks concerning our sin nature. In, in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it speaks concerning the works of the flesh. And, and, and Paul said it like this. He said, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. You can't explain that away. You can't argue that away. It's an act of the flesh. And so people very often try to explain sin away. But the Bible teaches that sin doesn't cease on its own. That sin doesn't go away over time. That you don't outgrow it. What you do is you actually perfect it. You know this. When you were a kid, perhaps, perhaps you lied. I know that every person in this room lied. If you say you didn't, you just lied. So, but you know when you were a kid and you lied, you got busted. Because you weren't good at it. You know, you weren't good at it. You, you just weren't. You know, you practice long enough, you, you can become president. I mean, you, 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 ooh, you, uh, <laughs> you can get good at lying. You can get good at stealing. You can get good at a lot of things. If you practice enough, polish it enough, you get good at it. And so when people say, oh, I outgrew my sin. No, you don't outgrow sin. You never outgrow sin. That's not how it works. Sin is confessed. Sin is repented of. Sin is turned away from. But if you don't confess, repent, turn away, you remain in bondage. So Paul is speaking of the forgiveness of sin. And he's telling us that Jesus takes it away. When he speaks of forgiveness, that literally, the word literally means to bear away. It speaks of removing or taking it away. God removes, he takes away our sin. And our sin can never outstrip the grace of God. Why? Because God's grace has abounded towards us. So we should never think that our sins are too great to be forgiven. Take this home in your heart. God's grace abounds. There's not a sin you've ever committed that God cannot forgive you of. Not a single sin. God will forgive you if you repent, you confess, you turn away from every single sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin, from all sin. And so in Romans 5.20, it says, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So a key to the victorious life in Christ is to trust that God has truly forgiven us of our sins, no matter how deeply we have sinned, no matter how long we have sinned, no matter what kinds of sins we have sinned. When we repent, God forgives. In Psalm 32, verses 3 through 5, the psalmist said, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I haven't hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. 
That's what God does. See, in redemption, we have forgiveness of sins. But not only that, verse 8 tells us that we have wisdom and prudence. Because we are saved, we now have two things that we didn't have before. In salvation, we actually gain wisdom. Now, wisdom has been defined as the understanding of ultimate things. Understanding things like life and death. Understanding things like heaven and hell. Understanding things like righteousness and, and what sin actually is. That's wisdom. And, and this is given to us, this wisdom, in God's word. Because it's God's word which instructs us about living in this world. Proverbs 2 verse 6 says, The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. That's why we study the Bible. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we want to know the word of God. Because it's in the word of God that God gives to us wisdom for life. But he also uses the word prudence. That's a word we don't use very much, if at all, outside of Scripture. The word prudence speaks of spiritual insight. It's a practical understanding for daily living. It's an understanding of how to live. Proverbs 8, verse 12 says it like this. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. I find knowledge and discretion. So prudence is wisdom applied and practiced on a daily basis. And that's what equips us to live in peace. And that's what equips us to share this kind of truth with other people. And so he says in verse 8, which you made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence. His riches of grace has been abounding towards us, and we've become wise and prudent through that. Verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. So God has made known to us his plan of redemption of grace through faith. The plan of salvation by faith was at one time hidden, but it's now revealed by the gospel. And notice it's been pleasing to God to reveal his plan, and his plan is centered on Jesus Christ. And the plan originated with the Father, and he says, is pleasing to him, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. It's pleasing to him. So this plan originated with the Father. Isaiah 53, 10 says it like this. This is a beautiful scripture. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. It's his will. The plan originated with the Father, and it was well-pleasing to him that he would give his son Jesus to die on that cross for us. In verse 10, he says that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he's going to gather together in one in him. Now, When he says in verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will, that word mystery speaks of something that at one time was hidden, but has now been revealed. So that mystery has been revealed when God determined that it should be. And the mystery is that the Gentiles can partake in the blessings that were once reserved for Jews. I was sharing with you last time that, or before that, that, Humanity in the scriptures is actually divided in the, in the Old Testament as Jew and Gentile. The Jew were the people who were the co covenant people of God. The Gentile is referred to, and we'll see this in the book of Ephesians, the Gentile is referred to as those who are without God. So in the Old Testament, humanity is divided Jew and Gentile. But when you get into the New Testament, you'll see that humanity has been divided into Jew, Gentile, and the church. The church, and we'll see this as we go through Ephesians, but the church is made up, it's called the new man, and is made up of both Jew and Gentile. The Jews did not see that in the Old Testament. They did not understand that God was through his son Jesus, who was Messiah of Israel. They didn't realize Messiah of Israel would also bring into the fold those who at one time were not his people. 
And so what God has done is he gave his son, Jesus Christ, this mystery that at one time had been concealed. He has given his son, Jesus Christ, and the mystery that which has been concealed has now been revealed so that we who are not Jewish have a relationship with the God of Israel based on the son, Christ, who came to die on a cross for us and brought us into the fold. We were those other sheep that Jesus speaks about in John 10, other sheep I have. Well, we were those other sheep. The Jews were his people. And though they had disobeyed, he still had a work to do amongst them. But when God sent his son Christ to die on the cross, Jesus died not just for the Jewish nation, but he died for all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, which includes Jew and Gentile. So that's what makes us one. And that, again, is what I believe is God's uh, remedy for, for, for one race hating another. It's, it's that, <laughs> how can I hate my brother? You know, if, that, if, if, he's, uh, if he's black, if he's Asian, or whatever the color may be, how can I hate my brother? You know, I'm not of the wicked one, even as Cain was of the wicked one and slew his brother. But I am of the Lord. And those who hate their brother, John tells us in 1 John, don't know the Lord. And so when the Lord has saved us, what happens is we begin to be the family of God. And this mystery of how is God going to save the world, which is so large and has grown larger over time, he's going to do it through Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross and poured out his blood, he poured out his blood for humanity, for Jew as well as Gentile. And when the Jewish person came to faith in Christ, and when the Gentile came to faith in Christ, they became one in Christ. And so it's no longer just Jew, and it's no longer just Gentile. It is now the one new man called the church. And that comes through the gospel, and that is that mystery, that the Gentiles can partake in the blessings that were once re reserved for the Jews. In Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, Paul said it like this, He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he's a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. The true circumcision, he's saying, isn't on the out, outer, it's on the inner, it's in the heart. And so we came to faith in Christ and were brought into the family of God. And notice in verse 10 that he did this to gather together in one all things in Christ. When he says gather together, gathering together speaks of summing something up. And this is all going to take place uh, beginning in the millennial kingdom and will continue into eternity. The millennial kingdom is Jesus' thousand-year reign on, on, on earth. At the end of the thousand years of, of Jesus' reign, we looked at this in the book of Revelation. Satan's influence will be completely eliminated. Jesus will then rule and reign. And the paradise that was lost by Adam will have been completely restored by Jesus Christ. And at that time, in Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, it says, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He says in verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. So in him we have obtained, notice, an inheritance. <laughs> the, the word inheritance is an Old Testament concept. The... The tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes, the tribes of Israel were to receive an inheritance. And the inheritance that the tribes re, uh, were to receive was land. So Israel, that land, that promised land, was divided amongst the tribes. But there was one tribe that did not receive a portion of land. And the, the tribe that did not receive a portion of land is the tribe of Levi. What they received were blue jeans. It's just a really, no. They all wore Levi's. So that's a new concept. Now, the tribe, 
The tribe of Levi, I'm sorry, the tribe of Levi did not inherit a portion of the promised land. Interestingly enough, when you read in the book of Deuteronomy and other portions of Scripture, Deuteronomy 10, verse 9 and all, uh, fellowship and service to God was the inheritance of Levi. Their portion was not land. Their portion was God himself. That's what they received. Their inheritance was a fellowship with God. So the believer's inheritance is God himself and the blessings that come from fellowship with him. Remember John 17, verse 3. Jesus said, this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is life eternal, that they may know you. You know, I mentioned to you, I have a friend of mine, a friend that I had for, well, I've known for since 1983, Ray Bentley, and some of you, I've already mentioned this. Ray had a heart attack and complications, apparently, from COVID, and, and last week he died. And so I had um, a brother from the San Diego area who had called and asked if he could come and, and spend some time with me, and he came yesterday, and we spent some time. He's a, a pastor in that area. And we were having a conversation and uh, one of the first things he said to me is, he says, you know, he said, Ray, you know how Ray went home to be with the Lord? And I said, yeah. Yeah, I know. And we talked a little bit about him because this brother, is a, he's a younger brother. And, um, you know, he said, you know, when I started my ministry, and he gave me his testimony, a great guy, Marine, um, was in combat on three different, uh, three different occasions. He was uh, deployed to the Middle East and, and, uh, and he shared with me his injuries and things that he'd gone through. It was just real touching to, to speak to him. Good brother. But as we were speaking, he goes, you know, um, when I got out of military, he said, and I'd been injured so severely, I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. He said, and he said, I, 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 I knew the Lord. I had come to faith in Christ. And so he said, I went and I spoke to Ray, Ray Bentley there at Maranatha Chapel. And he said, I went and saw him, he said, and, and Ray was very good to me, very kind to me and very loving. He said, and he put his arm around me and he's helped me. And he said, and it's, it's, it's very painful to know that Ray, Ray has died because it's going to be a great loss to me on a personal level. And he says, you know what happened when he went home? And I, I said, I haven't heard many details. And he says, well, he said he was in his room and... Uh, one of his children, I believe, was with him, and they were next to him, and he said, I'm walking up the mountain with Jesus. And then he said, thank you, Jesus, and he died. I'm walking up the mountain with Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, and he died. Well, I told my friend, I said, oh, you're going to make me cry. That, that touched me. I said, that touched my heart. Do you think when Ray was on that bed and he was about to close his eyes, and do you think he was there thinking, man, I wish I'd have bought that car? Do you think? Man, I wish I'd have traveled more. Man, I wish I'd have bought those shoes. Do you think he thought those things, guys? Do you think that was in his heart? And the Lord spoke to my heart about that. And one of the things that I, I can tell you about myself in a personal moment is I appreciate shoes and I appreciate a car and I appreciate travel. I appreciate all those things. I would never say those things have no value. They do have value. And, and they can bring you joy and pleasure. They can. Thank God if you can do those. If you can buy shoes, thank God. If you can buy a car, thank God. If you can travel, thank God. There's nothing sinful about that. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters, and always remember this, is relationship. It's the only thing that matters. It is the only thing that matters. The end. 
you're not going to cry because you're leaving your car. You're going to cry because you're going to not see your friends. You're going to cry because I'm leaving my wife. I'm leaving my children. I'm leaving my friends. And it's not tears of, oh, boo-hoo, because you're going to heaven. But the thing that's in your mind isn't going to be material. I promise you. I've been at the deathbed of more than one person. I've never heard one turn to me and say, I wish I would have gotten that material thing. Not one single time. Not one single time. You see, your inheritance, your inheritance is not something, quote unquote, material. Your inheritance is fellowship with God forever. Forever. That's your inheritance. To be with him. Not things, but relationship. Not things, but him. This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So that's what we have. In him, we have obtained an inheritance. Our inheritance is God. Now, this inheritance of full fellowship is primarily future, but it became ours when Christ died on the cross and made it possible for us to have a relationship with God. In Hebrews 9, 15 through 17, for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while that one who made it is living. So the inheritance is primarily future for us, but it became ours when Jesus died on the cross. That's why you can have fellowship with God now, and that fellowship continues into eternity. And so in whom, he says again in verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined. This is something in the future that is so certain that Paul speaks as if it has already occurred. And the inheritance that is ours in Christ has now been revealed in two perspectives. One is God's perspective. Verse 11 again, he says, In him we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God works according to the counsel of his own will. And that's why in Revelation 4.11 it reads, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and for your pleasure they are and were created. You created all things for your own pleasure. But also he speaks of that in verse 12, those who have first trusted in Christ, that we should be to the praise of his glory. And so God chooses us, but we respond and we trust in Christ. Someone has pictured the divine and human side of salvation in this way. When you look toward heaven, you see a sign that reads, whosoever will may come. And after you enter heaven, you look back to the same sign and read on the other side, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. God has chosen us, but he's also invited us. And so that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory, the purpose of salvation because we trust in Christ is to bring glory to God. And that helps us to understand why the lives that we live should be lived in a way that would cause people who don't know God to believe that we do by the way that we live, by the testimony of our lives, by the way that we speak, the things that we do the places that we go not because it's legalistic but because we want to live lives to the praise of his glory because there's so so many times when I was first saved that I didn't understand that that I could actually cause someone to be stumbled in coming to faith in Christ by the way that I was as a person 
And for many years now, I've been praying, God, make me like you. Help me to lose these rough edges and to become kind and compassionate, caring, loving, sold out. Help me to be that so that, so that I might have credibility when I share with people and I say to them that, that God transforms people, that God changes lives, God saves people. Help me to have an impact. When we went to this, um, this um, dedication service, um, as we did this last week, Marie and I were pulling into the, the driveway of the church, and, and I rolled the window down, and uh, I said to the a man who was parking attendant, I said, is there a place that you have uh, for us we're supposed to park? Because I've never been to this place before. And the guy, I'm in Indio, and the guy looks at me, he says, hi, Pastor David. And I smiled at him. I said, hi, hi. And I'm looking at him. He goes, I went to your church. I said, really? A lot of people went. <laughs> I said, really? I was in your worship team with uh, Tony Logan. Tony was one of our worship leaders many years ago, 20-some years ago. I was in the worship team. I played bass. I said, oh, yeah. I rem no. I said, really? <laughs> he goes, yeah. He says, um, he goes, and, he, I, and he, I said, oh, that's great. He said, well, anyway, you're supposed to park over there. And I said, well, thank you. And I'm telling Marie, I said, what a blessing. And we go and we park and we come. He, and he comes up to where we're at. And he catches up to me. And he says, I just want to tell you something. He says, I want to tell you that, and this blessed my heart, so I'm sharing it with you. He said, I want to tell you that what happened is I was in the team, but I moved to North Carolina. He said, and I approached you after church one Sunday, and I said to you, do you have any churches that you recommend? And you shared some things with me. He said, and we moved out to North Carolina. He lived out there uh, for a while, 20, well, many years. And he said, and, um, and he started sharing his, his story with me. And I'm just I'm really interested in what he's saying. I said, really, praise the Lord. And this is what he said, and there's a reason I tell you the story. It's to come to this. He says, I want to tell you something. He says, I want you to know that the things that you poured into me became the foundations of my life, that I have grown in Jesus Christ, and I've served him all these years. And I wanted to thank you for the fundamentals that have helped me to stay solid with Christ. And that is my heart for you. That's why we're going through Ephesians. So you may know what you have in Jesus Christ. So that you may grow. That we as a church may mature. So that we would be like him. So that our lives will make a difference. So that one day when we're laying on our deathbed, our last words may be, I'm walking up the mountain with Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's what it's all about, guys. Nothing else matters. That does. Nothing else matters. To know who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ. And how he has super abundantly poured out his grace upon you. And how he has loved you with an everlasting love. How he has washed you and cleansed you with his blood. How he has given you his powerful Holy Spirit. How he's given you the word of God to guide your footsteps and to give you wisdom. This is yours. God gave it to you. But what we need to do is embrace by faith and live by faith those things that he's already given to us. So may we as a church learn to live in that which he's already given so that we can live lives that count in this world. Father, I ask that you would speak.